Next, give in all you know about transforming parent functions. Show how you would apply each of the following transformations individually. So in the last lesson today and the lesson we previously did, we've been referencing all of these transformations that we learned. This right here will be our parent function, y equals base to the x of an exponential function. We're gonna do each of these individually. What will a vertical stretch of two look like in our function? y equals two times three to the x. What will a vertical reflection or a reflection over the x-axis look like in our function? y equals negative three to the x. It's important to remember that this negative is on that invisible one and not on the three. What would a horizontal stretch of four look like in our equation or in our function? y equals three to the one fourth x. What will a horizontal reflection or a reflection over the y-axis look like? y equals three to the negative x. How will, our, how will our parent function look if we want to shift right five units, which is a horizontal translation to positive five? y equals three to the x minus five. How about if I wanted to come up with an equation or a function that used all the transformations listed from a to f? If we were putting them all together, how would that look? negative two times three raised to the negative one fourth times the quantity of x minus five plus six. Now the last thing I'd like us to do is to just graph this example, this function that we just made. How would we graph without making a table of values this exponential function? One thing I wanted to point out is I have this little sketch of an exponential function. These two dotted lines, one of them is an asymptote and the other one is sort of just my vertical line that starts off on my y axis and then moves left or right. And then this purple line will move up or down. But I wanna go over the reflections. This would be if there were no negatives. If this negative in front of the two is involved, that means you have a vertical reflection, which means it flips in this direction and the graph will take on this shape. All the distances stay the same, but the curve is shaped this way. Again, if I start off with this shape and I only have that negative up in the exponent, that was our horizontal reflection. And that would mean that our graph would flip horizontally and it would take on this shape. But since we have both a negative out front for a vertical reflection and a negative in the exponent for a horizontal reflection, my graph will take on this shape right here. This is the plus six. Here is my x minus five. And I already did my initial value of three and I already did my horizontal stretch of four. I did not, however, do my vertical stretch. So I want you to try to draw this graph now. So press pause and give it a try. Now, hopefully you gave it a try. I'm going to go in 
and I'm just going to draw those purple and green dashed lines that I had drawn before. I'm going to draw my X and Y axis in after the fact. I'm going to draw them in after I have my entire graph finished. So it's sort of a hack for graphing. So you don't need to try to figure out if you could fit your graph. Now, if you were looking at this for inspiration, this was originally three units away, my initial value of three, my y-intercept of three, but I have a vertical reflection and a vertical stretch of two. So from here, where am I going to plot my first point? I'm going to plot my first point six units below where these two dashed lines intersect. Now each of the other points I'm going to come up with will be four units away in either direction because of this one fourth here causing my horizontal stretch. I'll have a point somewhere along this line. And I'll have maybe two more points, maybe I won't even fit two, probably just one more point, somewhere along that and somewhere along that. My base tells me what I multiply by as I get bigger. So I'm multiplying by three. 6 times 3 is 18. I don't really think I'm going to fit 18 here, but I guess we can try. That's 6, 2, 4, that's 12. That's 18. And it just barely fits. Now, if I go this way, I'm going to divide by 3. So if I go 4 units over this way, 6 divided by 3 is 2. I'm really not going to fit much more. And that's really my graph right there. Now, there's actually another hack we can use that I mentioned in the last lesson. So another thing we can do is just say that each of these boxes is two units and we will automatically be causing this vertical stretch of two as long as we keep these boxes going this way, one unit. So a little food for thought. Now, part of the big finish is to draw in the x and y axes. The big finish we're going to draw in our x and y axis. So if my graph moved five units to the right, that's this green line, then I'm going to move five, one, two, three, four, five, to the left to put in my y axis. There we go. And if this graph moved up six from here, I'm going to move down one, two, three, four, five, six. And that right there is my x-axis. If you tried to graph this by making a table of values, I just want you to think how terrible that would be. If you plugged in one, two, zero, negative one, and negative two, you're going to get values that are way, way down here. And I don't think you want huge, well, very, very small numbers, very, very, very negative. You'd have to still plug in things closer to five. But even then, if you plug in five and the number's right next to it, you're not gonna get nice whole numbers, you're going to need a calculator. So if you plug in five, the next number I would plug in is four units over and four units over. But if you understand a graph, it makes that a little bit easier. Next, if you're gonna do this, I would just say let's label the important numbers. So let's put a six and let's put a five right over there. 
Maybe we can even label a couple ordered pairs. We'll label two. So this one, if that's five, that's nine comma four. And this point is five comma zero. And the last part we want to know, it's written all the way on the bottom here. What's the domain range and asymptote equation? The domain of this function was negative infinity to infinity, as it is with all exponential functions. The range is from the bottom to the top, so that should have been negative infinity until six with a parenthesis, not a bracket, we're using interval notation. If you were using inequalities, you could say something like all real numbers, you could say y is less than six, but this is a little bit better. My asymptote equation, what kind of asymptote is it? Horizontal, and the equation of all horizontal lines is always y equals something, and what does y equal? That thing we can't touch, six. So that's the end of this lesson for now. I hope you liked it. I hope you're able to do your homework tonight. I want to give you a little sneak preview of some word problems. I'm not going to solve them. I'm just going to point out a few things. So first, bacteria can multiply at an alarming rate when each bacteria splits into two new cells, thus doubling. Doubling means that we're increasing by 100%. So that would be 1 plus 100% as a decimal is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. And that's why we always think of times two when we double. So if I have to do an exponential function for this, one plus r over n is going to deal with a one plus one over something. If we start with only one bacteria, so we're starting with only one, that's your principal, you have one bacteria, which can double every hour. So in this case, it's doubling every hour. That doesn't mean it doubles such that the percentage is compounded over a day or something like that. So we are going to take out one small piece. Instead of doing a, I'm just going to write a instead of a of t, equals p times 1 plus r over n to the nt, I'm just going to write this because I'm not dividing up my rate, my rate does happen every hour. How many bacteria will we have by the end of the day? If I let t equal time in days, and we double every hour, then we're going to have a horizontal compression of 24. That will mean n equals 1 over 24. My rate is still 100%. That will double. And I started with one cell. Pay attention to units. Pay attention to this little trick here. Next, just giving you a sneak preview of a few. Find a bank account balance if the account starts with $100, so that 100 is going to be your P, or principal, has an annual rate of 4%, there's 4% again, R is 0 0.04, and the money left in the account for 12 years. So if you left the money in the account for 12 years, at that interest rate, how much money is in your balance what amount is there at the end of 12 years. This one, pretty simple, we're compounded only annually, so that's since it only had an annual rate of 4% and there was no mention of the interest accruing quarterly or monthly, semi-annually or anything like that, that means n would just equal 1. third problem. In 1985, there were 285 cell phone subscribers in the small town of Centerville. 
the number of subscribers increased by 75% per year after 1985. How many cell phone subscribers were in Centerville in 1994? I don't even know if cell phones existed in 1985. Seventy-five percent per year. Again, this is still pretty simple. Okay, you'd have to figure out how many years are between these years, and you can use this when time equals zero, and you can use this when time equals a different number. Okay, that's how many we initially started with, and you could take it from there. So I'll give you a handful of word problems, and hopefully that advice will help you out.